Good afternoon. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you E4C's virtual salon in partnership with IEEE on the topic of engineering a circular economy through waste energy solutions. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the president at E4C, and I'll be introducing our moderator for today's event. The salon you're participating in today um, is a one in a series that we'll be hosting throughout the year and uh, will be archived on E4C and our YouTube channel after the event for your listening pleasure. Both of the URLs uh, for where you can find the recordings are listed on this slide. If you're just interested in actually tuning into additional webinars, information on our webinar series is available on our webinars page. E4C members receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team or myself. Uh, you can see the URL listed here. Now, before we move on to our moderator and presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about engineering for change. E4C is a knowledge organization and a global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite all of you to become members. The first C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leadership, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve your resources aligned to your interests. For more, please visit our website and sign up. Now, as an example of the types of solutions uh, that you can find in our solutions library, I wanted to highlight uh, this one that is uh, particularly relevant given that one of our speakers represents this organization. This is the Sistema Via Bolsa Biodigester, which will be covered in quite a bit of detail, I think, by Alex. But uh, you can uh, see just a little bit of an example here of what it looks like. Um, in the solutions library, you can learn more about the technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models for any of these systems. All the information is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. And it's available to E4C members free of charge. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by telling us where you are in Africa. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the main screen. It looks like a little bu bubble, uh, which is in the middle of the slides. So I'll just get us kicked off so that you can see uh, where I am. And we can see where you all are. So again, if you do not see the chat window, um, try clicking on the speech bubble that is in the middle of the slides, bottom, at the bottom of the middle of the slides. I see that folks are answering in the Q&A window. Thank you. I see some folks are in Nigeria, but do try to use the chat window. So uh, they're a little bit different. All right. If you are not able to see, I see an additional, there we go, in case you see some folks entering. Does everybody see the chat window? Kenya, there we go. All right, we're doing it. Lovely. Very good. We'll, we'll keep the Netherlands. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. All right, so during the webinar, uh, you, you can use the, um, or the, during the salon, you can use the Q&A window. Uh, to go ahead and ask questions, but you can make comments in the chat window. Again, if you don't see the Q&A window, you can uh, just uh, click it, uh, the icon, uh, again, in the middle of the screen, uh, and you will be able to see that. All right, very good. Thank you so much, everyone. So if you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. 
You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. So you first see webinars and salons qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of our professional development page after the presentation. You can also find information if you are a member in your member portal. So today we will go to about an hour and a half, depending on the volume of questions. Uh, so that's just a special note for everyone. All right, now with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to our moderator for today. Uh, Tom Decker is an analyst with the venture development firm Factor E Ventures, whose mission is to improve lives in the developing world through increased access to sustainable energy and related services. Tom is an environmental and mechanical engineer providing technical research support to Factory's portfolio and internal projects. He has specialized in renewable energy technology through five years of experiential and consultant experience in hydropower, biogas, and solar panel system. Tom holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Resources Engineering from uh, SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Colorado State University. He was a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow and also is a Past Engineering for Change Research Fellow. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom to get us started and introduce our presenters. Tom? Thank you, Yana, and thank you everyone for tuning in to the virtual salon today. Very excited to introduce our panel participants and very excited about the discussion, the, this upcoming discussion revolving around waste to energy in the circular economy. So first, would like to, to thank Alex Eaton, Ignatius Wakwa, uh, sorry for, the, for butchering that, Ignatius, and Jos van der Ent. So first, I wanted to give an introduction to the concept of waste to energy, the technology categories within waste to energy, and the current market situation around waste to energy. Beginning with, with the technology categories, waste to energy is, is one that is, is very exciting because utilizing waste and converting the resource into energy closes closes certain loops that would otherwise be left open. And there are certain opportunities to convert waste to energy that fall within, within different categories. And the first is biochemical. And this one is potentially the most exciting uh, going forward and has the, the most significant growth of all the sectors within waste to energy with a 9% anticipated growth year over year. And with a $30 billion a year market, that 9% growth is very significant. Uh, and, and the next would be thermal chemical. And this is the, the most dominated waste to energy conversion category on the market today, representing nearly uh, 80 to 90% of the total market uh, of converting waste to energy. Other categories include energy efficiency, converting waste heat to, to electrical energy or mechanical energy. And another category is processing and upgrading, so potentially converting waste to higher value products such as briquettes or converting a certain waste products that uh, may still have high value in terms, of, in terms of methane and converting that to higher value products such as dimethyl ether. So those are a couple examples of, of the different technology categories within waste to energy. And I would like to move on and, and get started to the, the main part of the show here, which is the introduction to our panelists, their, their roles in, in their organizations that they're, they're involved in and potentially some of the technologies they're involved in, and then move on to, to a few pertinent questions that we have for our questions that we hope will achieve some of the objectives that we've set for today's salon. And then end the, the salon with, with some time for Q&A for our panel participants. So, so before I get started and, and hand over the, the conversation to Alex from Systema.bio, I would like to just go over the objectives first. First, at a high level, we really would want to understand these technologies that I talked about in their place among the range of energy, energy solutions in Africa. Second, want, we want to learn about the, the technology advances that can drive scale. And third, we'd like to consider the potential challenges to this technology's viability. And I hope through the questions that, that I pose to our panel participants 
and the discussion that follows, we can, we can hit those objectives and really learn more about the waste energy market. So without further ado, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Alex. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm actually calling in from Mexico City, which is our headquarters here. And I'm really happy to tell you a little bit about Sistema Bio, a modular biogas company. And um, I'll just start a little bit by the, the sort of what we're doing and, and who we're trying to serve. Um, we are really moved by the fact that 80% uh, of the calories consumed on Earth today are grown by small farmers. And it's really important to remember that this is a, a, a group of people that, um, you know, are extremely important in the overall management of arable land. But really, it's a, uh, a group of people that systemically lack access to good technology, good training, and, and importantly, financing to make investments in, in their small farms. So um, uh, we, we see a number of really important reasons why uh, technology should focus on, on smallholder farmers, specifically uh, about a billion of the poorest people on earth, so living on less than $2 a day, are small farmers. Small, small farmers are growing a huge amount of the food that's consumed today, yet are the most likely uh, to have food insecurity. And so, and, and, and overall, it's a huge group of people. We're talking probably between 2 and 2.5 billion people uh, live on farms or uh, in their household uh, make part of their income through farming. So kind of with that said, from the social side, there's a huge opportunity to attack poverty, but also... Uh, on the env environmental side, obviously agriculture accounts for just over a fifth of greenhouse gases produced today. And uh, in this slide, you can see how that kind of breaks out but into livestock and, and some of the other activities that come from that. So we really uh, try to address um, just over three quarters of that, of that impact from, from agriculture in the systems that we work with uh, converting waste to energy. And so uh, our work is to really address three critical factors for farmers, which is kind of at the heart of, of this panel here. Um, first is the waste management system. Uh, most farms don't have a very well uh, developed waste management system. And what we're seeing in smallholder agriculture around the world is that space is very, very limited. So you end up having these huge piles of animal manure and um, you know, big ponds of animal manure really closely packed around where people are living um, without really good management potential for that. Um, a lot of farmers are still using biomass fuel to meet most of their energy needs, and a lot of this happens on a three-stone fire or really underdeveloped stoves, so that is obviously a driver for both deforestation and a, and a number of, of health impacts. And, and finally, uh, we have a situation where there's uh, farmers are living either with extremely limited access to to agricultural inputs um, and or are still living sort of a, a slow rolling version of the green revolution where uh, uh, over fertilization and, and inefficient use of chemicals and pesticides are creating infertility in the soil, uh, contaminating local waterways, and in, in many cases locking farmers into economic cycles of inputs and credit that are quite abusive and leave farmers in the cycle of poverty. So kind of with that panorama of, of who we're trying to work with and who we're trying to reach, our solution is really uh, very, very simple, um, probably really well known to everybody here, um, in that what we're con doing is converting small amounts of organic material from, from farmers' homes uh, to create clean energy for cooking to displace that and to um, help them convert those nutrients into usable agricultural inputs uh, to reduce, either increase their yield or reduce the amount of chemical fertilizers that they're using. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more detail about the, the product exactly, um, but first, you know, it. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a biogas system, which has 
the technology that's really existed in some form or another for almost a hundred years. And, and it's existed around the world in lots of different forms. Um, what we tried to do was create a, a technology that, that met a number of very simple criteria. Um, so when we sat down to design, we were really looking at the limitations of the, the site-built systems, which were most of the brick and mortar and, and um, some of the, the more basic plastic systems that were built in site. And what we saw is that we really needed a system to be extremely durable, so um, be able to resist UV and resist all the, the hard conditions that are found in a farm, really easy to install. We wanted to think about scale in terms of how quickly we could get uh, systems in the ground and working. And they had to be a range of different sizes. So we, we serve farmers from about two to 200 cows in waste equivalent. So that's a um, you know two orders of magnitude of treatment capacity um, that we're able to provide. And then um, the systems are modular, so we can to connect them. Uh, farmers can grow over time, but we can also take the systems out. So that allows them to be used um, as a guarantee uh, for asset financing. Um, you can see here a little bit the scheme of what we're working with, uh, a very simple reactor with, with the waste hopper, really nice user interface on the way in, and, and uh, bio slurry um, storage on the way out. And then we can basically run the gas the, the, that we capture in the system at, at very low pressure into uh, simple cooking solutions. So uh, different burners and stoves that we designed for different markets and water heaters. And, and then we can also run a series of engines on biogas that allows us to run chaff cutters and, and, and processing of grains and water pumps and milking machines and that sort of thing. And, and that same engine or other engine platforms can also produce electricity um, that can be used for on-site or actually put back into electrical grids where that's available. So uh, that's a bit of the overview of the technology. Um, we, we, we work with three uh, market segments within the overall small farmer market. Um, subsistence farmers, so you can see in the foreground here our smallest system, um, six cubic meters, that's enough for a, a family to fertilize about three hectares and, and have four to five hours of cooking gas a day. Uh, the, the smallholder farmer, the kind of young entrepreneur that we're trying to focus on um, would use our middle range of systems, so somewhere between 8 and 40 cubic meters. And that's basically for farmers with, say, 10 to 80 cows and, and really working uh, to build up these small businesses. And then we also, uh, the modular nature of our system allows us to uh, reach larger larger farmers, so up to 200 cows um, or 2,000 pigs in, in waste equivalent, where we can interconnect the systems and, and provide secondary slurry management and, and more advanced treatment options where that's necessary. So that's kind of the range of the, the technology and farmers that we're working with. You can see uh, we have a range of biogas appliances from stoves, simple boilers, um, heating systems for piglets, heat exchangers for heating heating space um, and, and running more industrial boilers as well. Um, this is sort of a look at the different types of uh, productive mechanical and electrical generation. Um, we've been running a lot of water pumps recently as well, which is um, obviously uh, a big need in, in, in rural areas. And the biofertilizer application um, is probably where we see the most opportunity. Um, the, the fundamentals within anaerobic digestion really allow the carbon change chains and manure to be broken down and make those nutrients available for farmers. So we're working on different irrigation systems and transport schemes that allow us to both build the biofertilizer into other organic practices like compost and um, also be able to transport and commercialize that. And you can see we've worked on more advanced um, application processes and we have farmers with um, uh, tracks of 20, 40, 50 hectares under under management using the biofertilizer. Today we uh, operate out of hubs in, in Mexico, Nicaragua, Colombia, Kenya, and India. So um, from those hubs we serve other countries in the region um, and, and we estimate that we're probably 
um, working with a market of about 100 million farmers from, from the, the markets where we're operating today. So that's a team of about 150 full-time staff with about 300 other uh, promoters and, and uh, field technicians that, that work with us as well. So uh, just very quickly uh, to close, the, um, just to add a tiny enterprise angle here, we, we see our business is broken up into three uh, distinct pieces. Um, uh, the first is, is all the manufacturing and distribution of our product line. So we manufacture all the reactors and assemble all the other parts and pieces so that this is a system that comes as a complete kit and um, we transport those around the world uh, and then also cover the last mile. And then um, all of the outreach is really done as an educational model that allows us to, to introduce this technology into rural areas where it's not that well known, uh, sell the system and then maintain and service, uh, make sure that there's a full training for farmers and, and periodic follow-up. And then we finance all of those systems or a percentage of those systems uh, with a 0% with a interest loan that allows farmers to divide their payments over time and, and manage the, the investment as the benefits are, are paid back to them. So that's just a quick overview of, of our technology and kind of how we get it to the field. Um, happy to, to take questions after. Thank you, Alex, for the, the introduction to Systema Bio. Next, we'll try to see if we can get Ignatius on the line. Ignatius, are you able to, to speak so we can hear you? Yeah, so basically, um, I'm going to present about uh, right to rest to energy. Um, I was a research fellow uh, for energy uh, at the Engineering for Change, the 2018 cohort. And uh, I, I work at Strathmore Energy Research Center, and I am a research uh, assistant. I basically work on um, renewable energy research, and I'm also uh, the membership development chair of uh, the IEEE Kenya section. So I'm, I'm going to talk about Rapid Waste to Energy, which is a, a, waste, a waste to energy technology that is being employed in Africa. It's actually the first of its kind uh, that, that has a, a capacity of 50 megawatts and can actually uh, convert 1,400 tons of waste every day. And um, yeah, that, that is what I'm basically going to talk about and uh, I'm trying to on the slides. So, um, like I told you, uh, the Rapid Waste to Energy is, it's, is Africa's first major waste energy facility. It, it's in Ethiopia, and uh, the the inauguration of the project uh, was uh, was was in August 2018. And like I told you before, uh, the, the the facility has a capacity of. 1,400 tons of, of, of converting 1,400 tons of municipal waste, which I, th I think is a big thing in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it also, it's also important to, to realize that the waste in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has a very low, has a very low um, calorific value, value and, and is very moist. So this, this waste energy technology actually takes into account uh, this and is a unique uh, waste to energy technology. This is a big thing in Africa, in, in, in my opinion. And this this is an example. This is the, the photo of the of the plant in Addis Ababa. And also, uh, I also think waste energy is an, impo is, is, is an important te technique, considering that population the population is growing in urban Africa. Um, and, and with increase in population, there's also an increase in, in the waste disposed in, in urban cities. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ignatius. Ignatius, can you, can you make a, a just a quick comment around where you're calling from and, and a little bit more about, about Strathmore Energy Research Center? Just a quick note okay. on that. I think that would be, be interesting and relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm calling from Nairobi from Strathmore. Sorry, I had a, a problem connecting earlier. Uh, so uh, 
I work at Strathmore Energy Research Center and at Strathmore Energy Research Center we do three main things. Uh, we carry out research on renewable energy product, projects. Uh, we also carry out capacity development in renewable energy. We have trainings in solar, uh, installation and designs to technicians in three categories that are specified by the Energy Reg Regulatory Commission of Kenya. And uh, we also carry out testing of solar pico systems, uh, like solar home systems, and uh, solar lanterns. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Ignatius, and, and thanks for the introduction to the waste energy plant in Ethiopia. Very exciting to see that progress and to see some evidence of, of, of the construction of the facility here on this current slide. So now I, I'd like to, to introduce Yos, uh, if you're there and, and are ready to, to introduce, introduce yourself and, and Safi Sana, it's all yours. Yes. So good uh, afternoon, morning all. My name is uh, Jos van Ent. I work with Safi Sana. Um, I'll give a small introduction in, in what we do uh, with Safi Sana. Um, so currently the reality is that uh, there's a lot of toilets. Uh, currently built in uh, like Ghana in this uh, this picture um, where you can see that often the waste is uh, just dumped uh, from here it just uh, goes into the sea untreated uh, what you often see as well is that, that different waste streams are are being um, gathered together in, in the drains so as you can see here in the front you see um, uh, a liquid waste uh, combined with rubbish, uh, organic waste, uh, and this is just uh, close to where people live. Um, so here uh, you see that 80% of, of the wastewater is currently ends up in the in the sea without any treatment uh, from the WHO number. Here you see fecal waste streaming into the sea uh, near Accra. Um, and 20% is treated. And often in Western world, you go to uh, high CAPEX and OPEX systems. Uh, this is just an example of, of one of these systems. Uh, and if you go to Ghana, uh, for example, there's often a lack of, of ownership or a lack of maintenance, which uh, make them break down. Uh, there's uh, illegal dumping, malfunctioning, um, uh, so that actually gives the opportunity. Uh, so Safisana, there, there's a growing demand for um, for nutrients uh, and energy. Um, so um, there's a system uh, where you can recover uh, uh, nutrients in in the waste stream, uh, collect uh, biogas, and bring it back to the grid. I think as Alex already uh, said as well. So, um, Safsana has a PPP construction, a public-private partnership, where we collect uh, waste from public toilets, uh, we collect organic waste, uh, we use an anaerobic digester, uh, similar uh, technology as, uh, um, as Alex was pointing out, but where we are on, um, on a larger scale. We, like this uh, current factory has an 1800 uh, cubic meter digester. Um, the, uh, we have a, a processing there to make it the hygienic compound, to make it into a nutrient-rich compost. And we have a, um, a generator to produce electricity, which can feed back into the grid. Um, here's a slightly more detailed uh, slide in, in, um, in how the processing looks like. Uh, at the, Step one and two, I just mentioned, here we mix the waste to something uh, like a slurry. We put it into an anaerobic digester. Uh, from there, we can concentrate the solids and use thermophilic composting to hygienize the material. And uh, with the gas, we can use the electricity and feed it into the national grid. Um, so here you see uh, truck drivers who are collecting fecal waste. Uh, this is a, a public toilet uh, near our factory. Uh, this is some pictures where they are collecting the waste from the markets. Uh, 
And uh, here you see on the background, you see the digester and in front you see uh, a truck uh, delivering fecal sludge. Uh, and in this slide, uh, you see um, uh, where there's uh, unborn manure, so the contents of cow stomach from a slaughterhouse, which is uh, uh, fed to the digester. Um, market waste. Uh, and see, and here we have the processing of solids, where we go into the the composting, which you can see here, uh, where we measure the temperature for the pathogen die off. And uh, in the end, uh, the material is is grinded and bagged into uh, uh, bags of compost. And uh, as going to the farms. Um, and this is uh, the inside the control panel of our generator. Um, um, so we, we actively uh, use a lot of community engagement. Like this is an example of the market queens uh, who are uh, happy to get rid of their, their organic waste because it prov uh, gives a nuisance there. It attracts rodents if it doesn't collect. Uh, meanwhile, we are a, a reliable uh, person or, or company to collect the waste, uh, so they're, they're guaranteed that it's collected uh, every day. Um, yeah, so the way forward, so we now have a factory in Ghana, in, in Accra, or a shaman, which is uh, in the greater Accra region, and uh, there are several uh, leads currently ongoing in uh, Uganda, Ivory Coast, uh, Ghana, South Africa, and, uh, and in Zambia. Um, and yeah, for the impact, we're now from 125. We intend to go uh, to reach to uh, 500,000 people in 2022. Um, so this is uh, the team in Ghana. Um, so oh, that was the end of my presentation. Uh, I think I should give it back to Tom now. Okay, yes, we, yeah. we can take the slides from here. Uh, Yos, thank you for the introduction to yourself and to Safi Sana. Uh, similarly exciting to see the growth of, of waste energy solutions in Ghana. So, so thank you again. And, and I think at this point, what we'll do is transition from introductions to each of our participants' uh, uh, institutions and technologies and transition over to a few questions that I think we'll, we'll uh, initiate a discussion around some of the key topics of waste to energy. And f the first one is, is a bit higher level in that we're seeing a progression of our world's power generation and supply and supply of different forms of energy to the people that need it. So it's our traditional power sources for electricity and for, for energy demand in general has been sourced from fossil fuels, fuels such as, as natural gas, methane, LPG, coal, oil, and we're, we're moving into a world where renewables are becoming more and more prevalent, and the technologies that enable us to convert waste into energy are becoming more and more common. Now the question that I'd like to pose, and I'll have some specific orientations for each of our panel members is how do our waste to energy solutions that we talked about on the panel today compare to traditional energy sources? And uh, I'd like to actually include renewable energy sources here as well because I, I see some, some differentiations between, in certain sectors of waste to energy, between renewable and waste to energy. So part of, you know, an angle on this question is, it, you know, is there potentially ambiguity around whether or not waste energy approaches are renewable and the significance of their climate impacts. So we, we've kind of been able to see different streams of, of, of turning waste into energy through, through our previous introductions. So in, in some cases we have, we have organic animal waste, in other cases we have food scraps, in other cases we have human waste, and then it, human, uh, human solid waste, and in some cases some municipal solid waste. So we have different streams that can be converted into energy, and, and how are those energy, uh, are those streams of waste turning into energy comparing to our traditional energy sources and our, our um, renewable energy sources? So Alex, if you could start and talk about Sistema Bios 
uh, thoughts around the similarities and differences. Are there, is, is, is waste to energy in, in your situation more flexible than our traditional energy sources? Is the target customer base different than the target customer base of our, of our existing power generation and energy assets? Uh, are costs cheaper? Some of, those, some of those metrics, could you use those to talk about, about what you think, uh, how, how your approach compares to our traditional and renewable energy sources? Sure, Tom. That's a great and really complete question. Um, definitely, I mean, I think I would potentially reframe the question a little bit in that uh, today it's going to be more and more important, and, and you just mentioned this, um, that the, the recovery of nutrients and, and relinking organic waste streams back into soil productivity and, and ensuring that we're closing nutrient cycles makes a lot of these technologies and approaches make sense directly. And so if we start looking at energy as the byproduct of a rational nutrient management system, then I think that that really informs the answer to the other part of that question, which is how does it compare to other energy sources? So, I mean, if we first sort of consider that you can effectively look at this energy as, as almost free or a byproduct of, of that other process, then, then obviously it makes sense from an economic point of view. The, the other thing that's really interesting uh, about uh, the most common or the, the waste energy system that was most presented here, um, which is anaerobic digestion, is that we're, we're producing a natural gas. And I think apart from fully electrified uh, world, I think that there's still a lot of uh, use of, of gas-based energy systems. Specifically, in the clean cooking sector, it's really hard to compare any biomass like direct biomass options to having a clean cooking gas in terms of just impact and, and ease of use for, for clients. Um, and, and the fact that we can now take that gas and produce mechanical energy directly or produce electricity that then can tie in with other energy systems means that that diversity, I think, is extremely important. The other is just the, the ability to make sure that we're making systems in a de energy in a decentralized way and uh, in the hands of the people that are using it is, is quite empowering, but also makes the energy system overall a bit more robust. So sort of thinking here about either mini grids or, or farmers that are a bit more self-sufficient or having multiple production points for national grids, it really helps make that energy system uh, stronger and and finally the uh, it's really hard to compare waste to energy energy systems with others in terms of greenhouse gases and and the environmental benefits because as soon as you pile on the greenhouse gas reduction from the waste treatment itself and from displacing chemical fertilizers um, and from displacing traditional energy forms you really have um, a much much stronger impact and so you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of solar energy. It's just, you'll never find a solar panel that's also gonna make organic fertilizer at the same time. So I think uh, the reality is, is that we need a really robust mix of renewable energies in, in the next couple of years um, and, and quickly. So I think uh, there's no real valid point trying to compare one with the other exactly, um, but, but I think waste energy has clearly shown that it can be economical, especially in the approaches that were shown here, um, trying to keep the technology more accessible. Great. Thank, thanks, Alex, for that, that thorough answer. And one of, that, one of those few last points that you made, I think, is, is really significant in that displacing fertilizer through the anaerobic digestion process and, and is a really important one in terms of climate implications. And, and certainly with the Haber-Bosch process of creating nitrogen-based fertilizers is a heavy pollutant. Uh, and contributor to climate change. So that, that point, I think, really does hit home and uh, is part of the reason why I think we're seeing much faster growth in the biochemical region of waste to energy compared to, to some of the other sectors. So while we're on anaerobic digestion, I, I'd like to pose the, the question to Yos. Uh, Yos, the approach of Sapisana is, is different than Sistema Bios in that it's a much larger system. It's, it, it is more centralized. Can you talk about how a centralized and larger system, and maybe you have a different perspective uh, of Sapisana is centralized versus decentralized, 
Uh, could you talk about how that affects the, the flexibility in, in cost and then what, what, how, what types of energy are you able to provide uh, to, to the people that need it? Is it electricity? Is it, is it cooking gas? Could you, could you talk about how that compares to some of the traditional energy sources? Um, yes. Uh, so first of all, there's indeed uh, a different uh, target group compared to, to Biosystema. Uh, we are in the, in the peri-urban urban areas, uh, so uh, much more uh, people per square meter. Uh, there's uh, much more pressure on the environmental uh, uh, or the, 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 the need of, of, of waste uh, conversion or treatment. Um, so um, what you see now is, is that um, often things are just dumped inside uh, drains, uh, providing all of diseases. So if, if you look at our system, um, uh, we're not a, a renewable or sustainable energy producer uh, as focus. We are using it uh, to sustain the, the treatment of waste. So it's a combination, as, as Alex already mentioned as well, uh, different aspects. So it's it's uh, the service that people get their waste treated. Uh, you produce some electricity, but looking at national level, uh, it, it's it's a minor uh, contribution. But because we are able to sell it, we can uh, sustain the rest of the uh, factory, and uh, and also reuse uh, the nutrients and bring back to farmers. Uh, in, in we we intend to stay to local farmer pockets. Um, Looking at the scale, um, indeed you need larger cities like Ashaman. We are now uh, it's 200,000, 220,000 people. I think they have a massive growth of like nine uh, percent per year or something. Um, and and the infrastructure needs to grow with that same uh, same speed. So they are are in the need of waste treatment there. Uh, uh, so, so if you look at it, you can reduce the C, uh, CH4, the methane emissions, because currently it's often dumped uh, in uncontrolled uh, dump sites. Uh, so there you make an environmental contribution. Meanwhile, you can use the energy uh, to bring it on the grid. Uh, so in our case, it's the national grid. So we don't have any local or not per se local beneficiaries in that sense, uh, but it goes into the national grid as a percentage of renewable energy. Um, yeah, I think that that answers your question more or less, Tom. Or? Yes, yes, it does. That That's great. Thanks for clarifying, Yos, and, and thanks for the for further insight into Safiasana's approach. Now, Ignatius, I, I'd like to, to focus on the municipal solid waste plant in Ethiopia. We've, we've talked about converting organic biomass, whether that be from humans, from livestock, or from from waste food, but now talking about converting municipal solid waste streams, such as household trash, industrial trash, into electricity, without the the process of of anaerobic digestion. So now we're talking about thermochemical conversion of waste to energy. Could you talk about the climate implications of of such a process, there are different types of, of emissions associated with that, and, and yes, it, it does displace other other uh, sources of, of energy. So I was hoping you could dive into a bit more detail there and, and give us some of your insights on on that process. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, first, uh, uh, um, the rapid waste to energy. Uh, project in Ethiopia is, is a waste incineration project where the, the waste is, is actually burnt, combustion of, of, of the waste, like you're saying. So this method is one uh, compared to other conventional methods of uh, energy generation. It is very expensive uh, because it is, it is capital intensive and operation and maintenance of, of the system is expensive. Uh, however, there are European standards that govern um, controlling of, of such systems. And uh, it is very interesting to notice that the rapid waste to energy uh, plant in, in Ethiopia actually uses these European standards to make sure, um, they actually make sure that they clean, they clean up the effluent from the, from the plant. Um, 
because if this is not taken into consideration then you're actually going to make more pol uh, more pollution into into the environment and it becomes more dangerous and the aim of 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 such plants is uh to reduce um the amount of waste that is generated in the cities yet also uh, generate electricity which is a scarce resource in uh, resource in in Africa um so in regards to this uh while comparing it to other conventional uh, energy sources i will say um waste to energy so solutions are similar to conventional uh, energy sources in that they they help to solve energy needs in africa and they, they require high initial capital cost um also uh remembering that uh, this waste that is left in landfills um contributes to uh, uh, uh there's a lot like Ian has just said uh, there's a lot of methane that is um that is exposed to the air when you have your waste um in landfill and this methane will be is, is, is about it's 25% more potent as a greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide um so in as much as you need to take a lot of caution uh, uh while handling waste incineration uh it also helps uh reduce greenhouse gas emissions and um and and uh, saves you space because you you're able to do away with, with the waste you have and also one advantage of, of of having of waste incineration is it's a renewable energy source because we'll see in africa uh like for example in nairobi nairobi generates 2475 tons of, of municipal waste per day but 50% of this is only collected and 50% is left in the city because you will find a lot of uh, waste disposed in in african cities um kampala the same dar es salaam the same so um i will say um it's 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 if if if, if you handle if you use stand, standards in 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 a great way then um the rest the, the rest the rest to energy solution um even waste incineration could be could, could actually be be a great a great solution yeah that is my i think that answers your question fantastic yes thanks ignatius for that perspective now with with about 10 minutes left of the discussion before q and a i'd like to combine our our last two questions and pose them to our participants here and really just going forward and looking into the future, the potential of waste to energy is very high. It's a growing, it's a fast growing market with really exciting opportunities and technology development. However, how do we get to that growth? How do we encourage that growth? And how do we, how do we speed that growth up? Is the question that I'd like to ask is, is what are the challenges and limiting factors right now currently for each of the technologies that we've spoken about and what are the key advances that that we can make or that are currently being made to overcome those challenges and limiting factors so the question specifically is are these are these advances in technology innovation are they in business model development are they in building capacity of customers or of policymakers to understand how waste energy can be built in to the market and to speed that growth up. So I, I'd like to start again with Alex and, and, and ask from your perspective, how, how, would, you, how would you approach uh, the, the key advances? What are you currently doing and how are those solving some of those challenges and limiting factors that hold back scaling? Thanks, Tom. Um, that's a really good question that we think about a lot. We, uh, I think my answer can be quite short. We can see all the technologies here have all been relatively mature for quite a long time. The biggest challenge is really the systems uh, management and kind of political and social will to really replicate these um, by many orders of magnitude, which is what we really need uh, to address the magnitude of the, the problem. So I think really we wouldn't have to advance any technology to reach 
hundreds of millions of people or hundreds of millions of farms. And so I think uh, really what we need is more innovation in the financing. You know, we need better, uh, from our point of view, we need, you know, better and more fair agricultural supply chains that give farmers better opportunities to invest. And we need just more rational uh, energy and, and agricultural policies that really push systems that are designed for sustainability. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. And Yos, could you provide your perspective? Uh, yes, so, so since we're more in the urban setting, I often see indeed um, you, you need a strong governmental uh, support, um, but but there is a big need for for samples. So, um, for example, they they need to see something working uh, before they will promote it. Uh, so that that's actually where we are now. Um, Another uh, difficult thing is that you're often competing, uh, since we're in, in the PPP construction, you're competing often in doing nothing. Uh, so every uh, processing you do is often uh, taking you more effort, which is, is hard to finance as well. Um, and if, if you look at a technical challenge, I think there, uh, it would be good that there's uh, more urban planning at, at, at cities. Uh, or like uh, regions uh, where, for example, you can make interesting combinations like uh, a waste incineration together with a biogas plant. Uh, if you if you could get uh, some sources separated because the the the, the moisture content uh, inside the the waste streams can uh, decrease the waste incineration efficiency. So if you could separate them, you could even get to more optimized. Uh, uh, systems. Uh, so that's uh, my my answer. Great, thank you, Yos. And just just as a quick housekeeping notice, we have a couple more minutes left of this discussion. I hope to turn this over to Ignatius to to wrap this up, and then we'll we'll get to the questions that we're seeing here in the chat. We're having some great questions come in. Thank you for the participation. Uh, it seems we'll dive into some more technical notes, uh, but. Just to wrap up, Ignatius, could you could you talk about again the the challenges and uh, limitations that maybe maybe overcome and what what's currently being done to overcome those with uh, with municipal solid waste to to energy? Um, <clears throat> for example, the greatest challenge of uh, municipal uh, waste. Uh, conversion to energy is, is the high capital and maintenance cost. And I think the solution to this is to have government incentives like like uh, Jan has just said before. Because um, th this will help and encourage the uptake of, of the technology. Also, uh, encouraging technological development and uh, innovation around this will, will, will actually make the tech technology cheaper because when you look at fossil fuels, the uptake of fossil fuels uh, is cheaper right now because it had a very huge, uh, there was a very huge government incentive on fossil fuels. So I think this model could also be taken up. But uh, I would like to uh, focus on Africa because there's one thing, uh, in most towns and cities in Africa, uh, they, we don't have a regular waste collection and disposal services. So this could uh, be a limiting factor to such technology. And they also have uh, very limited financial resources. So here the government will come in and there's limited technolo technical capacity and poor infrastructure around around waste to energy. And uh, that's where um, institutions like Strathmore Energy Research Center comes up with uh, capacity development uh, uh, solutions. Like uh, recently came up with a biogas, uh, biogas training to try and encourage uh, uh, organic waste to energy development, yeah. and, and also the, the lack and uh, there's a lack and weak enforcement of environmental legislation by the government and, and environmental awareness. So, if this could be looked into, I think uh, waste to energy technology could be more popular, like solar is popular right now. Okay, fantastic. So, thank you everyone for listening in to the the discussion with our panel participants. Now we'd like to move into the question and answer section. 
of, of this virtual salon. We continue to have good questions come in the chat. I would like to, to continue to encourage all of our, our listeners and participants to ask more questions as we go along. We have about uh, 30 minutes of, of questions that can be asked and, and we'll start that discussion start that discussion now. So we, we've been able to talk about the potential of waste energy, the different approaches to waste energy, some of the limitations and, and challenges and, and the approaches to solving those. And it looks like, you know, there's technologies that have existed and that are well developed and, you know, really the challenges around capacity, uh, around the skills needed in, in policy and government incentives to, to get these these waste energy technologies deployed and to utilize the, the wide range of waste products that we have in our world and convert them to useful energy and, and deliver that energy to the people that need it are, are really the, the challenges here and, and getting those deployed uh, in an effective and efficient way in, in the markets that uh, will facilitate economic success. So I, I think the, the future is exciting for waste energy and uh, we do have a technical audience here, so I think it would be useful to dive into some of the some of the technical questions. Uh, Iana, do you have anything to add before we we dive into these questions? No, other than I just wanted to note that I see that we have a mixture of uh, questions being asked in the chat, as well as some folks that are virtually raising their hand. So why don't we take uh, the uh, questions in the chat first, and then we're going to try to swing over to the folks who have raised their hands. We're going to turn on your audio. Um, we'll unmute you, if you will. And we're going to ask you to introduce yourself uh, before you ask your question. Just say, you know, where are you dialing in from, and, uh, and then pose your question. So um, that's uh, more on the admin side, and I take it over to you, Tom. Okay, great. The first question, and I'm going to summarize a few of these together, is there's some curiosity around how the efficiencies of waste to energy compare to other renewable sources, such as hydropower and solar, and what are the associated life cycles of the technologies, of the waste to energy technologies? So I, I'll, I'll open that up to our, our panel members and uh, just see if somebody feels, uh, feels like they could answer that directly. Yeah, I, I think the question is, is interesting and useful for, for comparison, but at the same time, um, it's a little tough. So when you're defining efficiency um, of a hydroelectric dam, are you talking about uh, the, the efficiencies of the turbine? I mean, obviously we have uh, solar efficiencies of the energy. The, the only way that these um, really compare very well to each other is when you compare uh, installed cost and potentially environmental damage. So we already know that there's a lot of environmental damage that comes from, from hydropower. We've seen the impacts of hydropower over time. Uh, we know that there's greenhouse gas effects and, and it's a pretty large sunk cost in terms of actual um, infrastructure building and then ma maintaining reservoirs and things over time. So it gets really hard to compare kilowatt hour to kilowatt hour over time. What we've done is some comparisons of our installed capacity and, and right now we can install say electrical, convert it into electrical capacity for you know, under a dollar a watt, which is I think really competitive with most other um, renewable energy systems that are out there. And so I think um, when you start looking at those different comparisons, it's useful, but at the same time, we really, in terms of clean energy, we kind of need all of them going at full speed right now. So in terms of them being competitors with one another, I don't think so because where you have waste to energy systems, um, it's because you already have waste there. So you might have sun as well, or you might have hydro resources. There's no reason not to use use all of them. So I, I appreciate the question, but I don't think we should be necessarily trying to compare head to head these these energy systems when, when we're really talking about waste treatment that provides energy as a byproduct. I also have uh, something to add on. Um, 
I also I, like uh, Alex was saying. I, I don't understand what you mean by efficiency, but the question is actually good. But looking at hydropower, um, like an example in Africa, I will see that hydropower is a very seasonal uh, source of uh, electricity. There are times where utility companies in Africa will ration electricity because their base load is actually dependent on hydropower. But you see now, um, when you look at um, waste to energy uh, solutions, uh, there's a lot of waste being generated every day. And uh, keep in mind that the urban population is growing. So this means that this is basically waste to energy is a renewable resource in that uh, the, the resource will always be there. It will be difficult to deplete uh, the, the, the resource in, in the long term. And um, also ask yourself, when you look at solutions, okay, I'm a big fan of solar energy, but this is just a question for you to think. Um, solar, solar will last for about 20 years, but what happens to the solar panels that are made out of silicon after the 20 years? We'll have a lot of waste. Uh, from solar panels, and this is something uh, to think about probably 20 or 30 years from now, you know, because um, we'll need to know how to handle such such waste in future. So th that is just for you to think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alex and Ignatius. I think just to chime in on the efficiency piece, I think you have different different modes of conversion. With, with anaerobic digestion and biogas, you may have, you may have your chemical to mechanical, chemical to thermal, or chemical to electrical conversion efficiencies that range across the board, and, and you'll get different numbers for, for each of those. And then with hydropower, you have your hydraulic to electrical or hydraulic to mechanical efficiencies. And, and typically, those efficiencies are much higher than, than in hydropower systems than if you are combusting a gas or combusting whether it's biogas or whether it's uh, syngas from a municipal solid waste plant. So those, those efficiencies are out there and, and they're in the literature and they range uh, from situation to situation. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting, but Alex's point of, of focusing on the entire renewable energy system, progressing that as fast as we can and deploying that is, is really important and we're seeing evidence of that across the world in both policy and in implementation. And it's, it's a big, it's a big, uh, point of emphasis across the world. So I think waste energy has a big, big place to play uh, in, in, that, in that movement. So let's, let's see if we can get another question here. Okay, so um, could we, we speak? Oh, go ahead. Yes, we tried to take, I mean, we tried to take one of the folks that have raised their hand, their virtual hand, that they've been waiting for some time. So, yes. uh, We'll ask uh, our Shirley to help us uh, unmute those folks and see if their audio is working. So why don't we go to Fred, Fred Tege? Yes, hello. Uh, my, name, my name is Fred Tege. I'm from Kenya, a student at uh, uh, Kenyatta University, IEE, Kenya section. My question is we are currently working on a project that uh, has to do with farmers and uh, sensitizing them about uh, recycling waste and uh, uh, producing energy, renewable energy. So the project utilizes IoT, uh, data science, and other methods. So my question is, is there opportunities for such projects to be funded, or what kind of support exists out there for such ambitious projects? Hi, Fred. Um, this is Alex here. We're operating in Kenya, so I mean, I think that there's uh, and there's a couple other um, initiatives working on on biogas around you. So I think um, there's probably an interesting uh, amount of of demand that could be created from enterprises that are that also are trying to move these forward. There's a there's a biogas program in Kenya uh, run by uh, SNV Evos um, and it's called the Kenya Biogas Program where there might be some some interest for those uh, types of interventions and and also uh, Kenya right now is getting uh, quite a lot of attention for for innovation around energy so um, powering Africa and and a few of the other international development programs. 
uh, with focus on, on farmers uh, could be a good place to look. Um, specifically, what is your technology? What, you said it's um, programming for improving people's perceptions on um, waste utilization? Yes. Uh, yes, it's a system that basically gives farmers information. They are able to analyze, um, get data from their farms, and also get uh, ways in which they can be able to get rid of waste and also convert them to use. Um, it sounds really interesting. You kind of cut off there at the end, but um, I mean, I think what you can see here uh, from the organizations that are represented is that we're really, um, you know, focused on enterprise solutions. So trying to prove um, demand and a business model for the, the services in tech. So um, it'd be interesting to, to hear what you guys are doing and, and see opportunities where you could maybe grow that as a startup. Uh, hello, Fred. Also, to add on, um, there's, uh, there's, there's the ISO posted by the American Society of Mechanical Indi Engineers. I think the, the call for applications is, is open. Um, and, and you can have your project uh, in the competition and you, you might stand a chance of, of winning or getting a, a donor. Also, we have the Kenya Climate Innovation Center where they welcome innovations. And um, at Strathmore University, we, we have a training course on, on, on not really uh, waste incineration uh, to energy, but biogas to, a, train, a, a training on, on biogas to energy. So you're very welcome. There are such, there are such opportunities around. Yeah, thank you. And there's a small um, side note as well is that, that we are on a different scale, but we have in the training packages for, for our plant operators, and we use mobile telephones uh, to collect data. Um, but uh, if it's more about information providing, uh, then indeed you might have to go to, uh, to different uh, type of systems. Um, you also mentioned IoT, uh, Fred. So um, we have been looking into that as well, but uh, one of the things to consider there is um, be aware that sensors uh, need, uh, need maintenance as well, and they can give you uh, wrong data if you're going into automated measurement. Thank you, everyone. So just to, for those of you who are uh, looking at the chat, we've added some of the links uh, to some of uh, the resources noted by our uh, panelists, so feel free to take a look at any of those. So uh, we're going to take one more of, of our virtual hand raisers here um, and uh, turn over to Solomon. Solomon, uh, we'll just unmute you here and we should be able to ask your question. Please let us know where you're joining us from and uh, who you are. <laughs> Solomon? What were you? Solomon, we, we hear some of your background, but we don't hear you. Would you like to try again? Okay, I'm not sure if Solomon has is, is, uh, stepped away, so why don't we just, uh, we'll come back to him one more time. And uh, Tom, I, I take it over to you to take some of the online questions in the chat. Yes, thanks, Iana. One <laughs> common theme that, that continues to come up is how do each of your approaches address toxic materials in the effluent streams of, of your technology? So for anaerobic digestion in, the, in the, uh, out, out the effluent of the digester, how are the effluents being treated on a technical level? And in the municipal solid waste incineration process, how are toxic materials being handled potentially in the the emission stream and in the ash stream uh, after the fact. On our side, it's um, actually really quite straightforward. We are very clear about what goes in into the system and, and what its use is. And so we, we generally only have to kind of think about 
um, volatile solids reduction to try to provide the organic treatment to stabilize the waste and then also um, think about pathogens on, on the backside. So um, at the temperatures we operate in, in the retention times, we're consistently achieving 98 to 99% pathogen reduction just within the anaerobic step. And then we provide another aerobic treatment process for the um, for the waste that comes out before it's applied to the soil. So we um, are able to meet international standards for for um, pathogens for soil application. We don't recommend the the effluent for say foliar feeding and those sorts of things. We feel really good about um, building uh, adding the the effluent back to the soil um, as, a, as a soil amendment. So in, in that case, we don't have buried waste streams in, um, in that sense. And so we're generally not impacted by, um, by some of those other uh, heavy metals and other questions. Um. <clears throat> Uh, like the rapid waste to energy project in in Ethiopia, um, they have two two treatment methods. One, they they clean about uh, the plant can, can clean about 220 cubic meters of waste leachate uh, every day. So so this is water that drains from a landfill and can be dangerous once it gets into contact with rivers and can pollute water and um, uh, heavy metal can be exposed. Um, in water that can be used for drinking and, and for other domestic applications. Um, also, the flue gas is, is, treat, is treated according to uh, the EU waste management regulations that I had also spoke up, spoken about. Because if this is not uh, taken into consideration, um, there will be a lot of uh, harmful emissions such as dioxins and, and heavy metals into, into the air. And we'll have uh, you will not have solved the problem like what you're trying to solve. One of the problems you're trying to solve from a waste to energy plant is also to reduce greenhouse emissions and to save the environment. So you will have actually uh, led to another problem. So these are two, two cleaning methods that um, are used at the RAPI waste to energy uh, plant in Ethiopia. Thank you. Yes, so, so in, in our case, it's also the pathogens uh, which are the main focus, indeed. Uh, but if you look at our whole processing, we have several barriers uh, built in for that. Uh, with one of the main important ones is, is thermophilic composting, where we have uh, high temperatures up to uh, 60, 70 degrees uh, for at least a week. Um, and we monitor this uh, to guarantee the, the pathogen dial. Uh, other barriers are like time of application. So in, in the case you have seedlings, uh, you grow, uh, it, it takes a long time before you actually harvest the crops. Uh, so in that combination, uh, we have a safe product as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for addressing that question. I think that's a question that comes up a lot when think, thinking about waste, but through the biological and thermo chemical processes of, of waste energy technologies, a lot of these pathogens can be reduced. And with the filtration methods and emissions filtration and, and handling of toxic metals in the incineration process, I think a lot of these worries can, can be reduced just as long as there are those, the, uh, the following of the international standards and use of the technologies that do so in the incineration process. Okay, now, uh, unless we, we don't have any more hand raisers, and I did see that Solomon wrote his, his question here, I, and, it's, and it's one that has come up a few times, is around the capacity building of the end users of the technology, and I think in the case of a centralized waste energy facility, it's, it's less of a concern, but with a decentralized approach of, of utilizing waste energy, you are, it, the technology that's being developed and utilized directly interfaces with the customer. So what types of capacity building techniques 
and approaches can be deployed to help overcome that barrier of, of the, the interfacing of a, of a customer with, with the technology itself. Tom, just adding to his question, though, I mean, I think it's important that, um, and I think this is what Waste Energy really gives us an opportunity to see, is that we really do need to be conscious about the amount of waste that's being produced. And so I don't think it's good enough to say, produce as much garbage as you want, and then we'll take it. I think the other point that was really well taken, I think, is that we all need to think about how we can reduce waste in general. So I think in that, that, um, that, that first part of his question is, is really important. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of customer interface, I think, um, honestly, this is not a very hard uh, question and it's not a very hard concept to visualize. We actually find that um, you know, I feel like I can explain anaerobic digestion to illiterate farmers that have not gone to school almost better than to academics and people that want to overcomplicate this, um, a lot of these these types of technologies. All we're really doing is repeating the the natural cycle of which there really aren't waste streams, um, and and so I think it's important that we realize that. You know, humans are really the only ones that produce a waste that's not in balance with the ecosystem that they're working in. So I think um, the, the concept's really not that hard. And, and if you can really show benefits to people, so um, creating policy that directly benefits them and giving them a very good way to, to interface with that policy. For example, in Mexico City, um, source separation, and in many cities around the world, source separation of organics is something that's gotten a lot of momentum, um, especially when people can see the benefits um, either in cost or, or um, in, in environmental benefits. So I, I think, honestly, this is a message that really people respond very well to. And so I think um, it's only about getting the word out there. It's not necessarily a, a massive challenge of helping people understand very complex uh, concepts. It's about getting people bought in so that there's the, the political will to do these things. Yosa, I'd be really interested to hear your perspective in the collection portion of your business as well. Do you see that, that initiative of source separation and uh, the collection of those, of those different streams that you bring into your plants? How, how would you see the uh, the mindset and the capacity of of those uh, sectors that you're working in. Um, yeah, so, so it's it's a lot of times about the incentive. So, for example, the market queens we work with, we've uh, we've done uh, some training with them, like what are uh, digestible products and what are not. Um, but also, it gives them a direct. Uh, interest that uh, they have less uh, nuisance uh, around because their place is more clean, uh, it attracts less rodents, so that's a direct benefit for them as well. Um, so uh, further, uh, different, because we have the largest system, uh, like our uh, waste producers uh, are in general not at our site itself. I can imagine that in, in, the, in Alex systems, people can see directly the changes if they would throw in, I don't know, a, a gallon of, uh, of gasoline uh, the, the system would break down and they see the, the downsides of it. Uh, since we're at a larger site, uh, that, that becomes a bit more of risk. So we have somebody with the, the whole day uh, checking the sources. Are they clean? Do we see any contaminations? Uh, then he, he goes back to the, to the people who are supplying uh, and, and see how we can solve that. Uh, so that, that, that there's the training component of the people who supply is, is quite large in our uh, system. Yes, talk for you. Uh, uh, um, so I'll say uh, waste to energy will, will actually lead to some long-term problems if you don't encourage recycling, uh, which is a good point you are talking about. Uh, because you'll find um, will end up burning most of the waste and recycling none, and this will encourage more waste production. Um, 
but uh, like the Rapid West, uh, the Rapid project in in Ethiopia is actually unique because they are able to sort uh, waste for recycling. Though this is not their main agenda, but um, uh, it is actually a plus because they they help to avoid this problem where that will motivate people to uh, or encourage people to come up with uh, produce more waste, you know, for for the gener for for energy generation. Great. Thanks. Thanks to you all for for shining some light on that topic. I think it's an important one to reduce our waste that we're producing and to be more efficient in the ways that we can we can separate the streams of waste that can be used in different ways. We do have a few more minutes left, and I think we we have covered the questions in the chat and the the people that have had uh, had questions by raising their hands. Iana, unless you see something else, I, I would just end with with one final question to the participants. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Okay, great. This is, is more of a, a left field question in that I'm just curious what what you guys are most excited about. If you had the freedom of the world in your hands to work on a waste energy project what is the most what's the thing that's exciting you the most where would you spend your energy if you could if you could devote all your energy to that to that one topic what would you do that's the most that you see is the most impactful the most uh, forward thinking the most leading edge technology or effort that that you could engage in tom from our side i'm really excited on the opportunity to better link uh, agricultural markets uh, as energy product producers and as nutrient recyclers. So I think uh, the opportunity for real resurgence in rural areas as they can diversify their agricultural businesses and become net energy producers, um, net fertilizer producers, and, and really allowing, um, uh, in our case, small farmers to kind of be the leaders as we transition to clean energy and as we think about how we start developing um, agricultural and forest lands as carbon sinks, I think um, waste energy is, is a fundamental piece of that. And, and so I, I'm really just excited about seeing, seeing scale in the work that we're doing and seeing how instead of working with 30,000 people today, we can be working with 30 million people um, as, as soon as possible, because um, you know, I, I think the the future that we can build using really simple technology and empowering people um, is is really exciting. Um, for me, I, 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 the opportunities uh, I would like to see in this is. Uh, the 60% of people in Kenya and, and in Sub-Saharan Africa who are not connected to electricity, actually having electricity in their houses. And we have a 30, about a 30, 30 hectares uh, dump site in Kenya called Dandora. I would also like to see this uh, being converted to a waste to energy plant like has been done in Ethiopia. And there are hopes for this because uh, the Ethiopian one was the first phase, so we hope uh, Nairobi will also be selected among uh, the second or the third phase. And uh, this will actually be a big achievement towards the realization of um, achieving uh, the development agenda in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, for me, I think it's not, not purely a, a technical uh, solution, but, but for me, what really drives me is, is, is uh, training and capacity building and uh, giving opportunities to people in, uh, in the local areas where we work and uh, see them grow. Um, so that, that would be my focus. You can, we have uh, several examples in our company uh, with people who are for uh, several years with us who really have uh, made uh, a lot of steps, uh, which is really uh, an energizing uh, energy for me uh, to see that happen. So, Tom, to you. 
You, know, so, uh, you cut off your there at the end. Did you pose the question back to me? Yes, I said uh, <laughs> back to you again. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Well, uh, thank. I, we have run out of time here. I would say that uh, I'm excited about the the future of of converting organic biomass into energy and continuing that growth path forward and really bringing the impacts of, of waste to energy to the people that really do need it the most, uh, those in rural areas, smallholder farmers that have access to those resources that need the, the, uh, the introduction of a technology that will bring the technology and the system around that technology, the, the team to do it, the, the support staff, the after sales service, the finances and business model of an integrated offering that can really achieve uh, livelihood of improvement. I think that's, that's a significant uh, piece of, of work that excites me, and I, I think Waste Energy has a, has a big role to play in improving livelihoods uh, in, in rural areas of, of Africa. So uh, thank you all for, for joining the, the virtual salon. I'll, I'll leave it to Iana to, to wrap <laughs> it up, and I, I'm really excited uh, within the sector and, and looking forward to future discussion. Thank you, Tom, for fantastic moderation. I, I can only echo your enthusiasm uh, because I think um, this is a really promising and, and growing sector. Uh, for all of you who have joined us, I'd like to thank you for attending today's virtual salon. Um, I, we will be sharing the recording with all of you, so if you've missed anything, not to worry. We will get to, uh, you will get to uh, afterwards. I'd also like to thank all of you who participated in, in the chat portion. Uh, there's some really great comments, uh, really insightful points that have been raised there. Um, stay tuned uh, for our next virtual salon. We will be doing this as a series. I'd like to thank you, IEEE, for uh, working with us on, on this exciting initiative. And if you have any questions or would like to suggest additional topics for the future and speakers, please do send us an email at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Uh, we also like to encourage you all to become E4C members to get information of upcoming webinars as well as virtual salons. And with that, uh, I leave you all to say, have a fantastic afternoon or evening, and uh, we will catch you on the next session. Bye-bye.